scenic mountain ranges, fairy tale castles, and yes, traditional hearty drinking establishments. Southern Germany has more than its fair share of stereotypes. But they hide an intriguing, mysterious hinterland, which I am determined to uncover. A side that's wilder, faster, louder. And frankly, completely bonkers. Are you supposed to sleep to this? My road trip starts in Bavaria's capital, Munich, home to BMW and some of the fastest cars in the world. but I want to get a different perspective. On the open road, checking out Munich. And here is one way to do that, inside this customised 1930s-style mini hot rod. It may look like a souped-up go-kart, but it's street legal and can go up to 90 kilometres an hour. Wow, it's like being a kid in a toy shop with the best sports car ever. How good can it get? My guide, a local man, is launching this hot rod experience as an alternative way to see this place. I pass some amazing classical architecture. Many of these monuments were rebuilt after World War II when the city was heavily bombed because Munich was the stronghold and some say birthplace of National Socialism. Today, in very different times, it's Germany's economic powerhouse and home to the world's biggest beer festival, Oktoberfest. But it's long been saddled with a conservative image. A lot of people would say it's Munich, it's boring, it's rich, it's traditional, it's beer and breakfast. What would you say to that? What a stupid. <laughs> I mean, I never heard, by the way, somebody telling Munich is boring. Uh, but you're completely right, uh, uh, people are aware of Oktoberfest and, uh, uh, and this is definitely an eye-catcher with people know around the world. I mean, we, we, we find about, just in these two weeks of time, uh, 6.2 million visitors. But I mean, it's not everything, right? I mean, I would say it's uh, the mixture of uh, tradition on the one hand and innovations on the other hand. I'm here to find little pockets of interest, something that will surprise me in Munich. Do you know anything? I have one for you, let's go for it. I don't tell you right now, but we'll go there. Isn't this great? They're surfing here in a river. <laughs> right, crazy guys, right? I mean, you find them every day, every morning, every night, especially on weekends as well. I've got to get a closer look. Good. <laughs> I think surfing on river waves is like quite popular in Bavaria for a long time. People did it behind bridges. Typical Bavarian inventiveness, hundreds of miles from the sea. This is definitely not for the novice. You need to develop a different sort of vision for the wave because it's quite intimidating, like it's really loud and you need to develop the muscle and all that. And like even like I felt terrible coming the first few times, you're like, because you just suck and then like you gradually get better, but it takes really long. And how popular has it become? The surf scene in Munich is quite big, actually. There's like, actually a surf scene in Munich. Yeah, who, who would have thought that? Not me, but I'm pretty <laughs> happy about it. Time for me to head out of Munich. But it's not quite as serene a journey as I imagined. Oh, 
This band, Desha Vida, are part of a folk revival in Bavaria, taking traditional music and mixing it with contemporary styles and rhythms. And they've got a passion for flash mob. A decade ago, traditions like this were out of fashion because for some, German tradition brought up too many negative connotations. But not anymore. The proudness of, of their own culture is, is now back again. And every style is, is included in this new music. It's not only folk music and not uh, only punk music. It's a, it's a mixture of every music now and the traditional instruments are back. In terms of the clothes you wear, some people might say, hang on a minute, this is just you being, this is just silly. This is not, this is just party, party dress. Is it party dress? No, it's not party dress, it's our culture. Uh, we wear it uh, very often, not only to have fancy time or have fun, um, we wear it to make music as well as at home when we, we are together in traditional uh, festivals and uh, we wear it at the office and we like to wear it. It's our, it's our clothes, um, we are proud of it. And off they go, spreading their new take on an old sound to more unsuspecting commuters. My next stop is right on the border between Germany and Austria, Berchtesgaden, the location of Hitler's notorious holiday hideaway, the Eagle's Nest, but it's also home to the country's only Alpine park. And there's an unexpected aspect to this breathtaking scenery, one that runs completely contrary to the cliché that Germans are straight-laced and serious. One of the peaks here, the Untersberg, is renowned for the paranormal, with reports of time-shifting and of unexplained disappearances. Hitler thought the mountain harboured special powers that would help him win the war. But nowadays, the Untersberg is seen as a spiritual retreat, and it's said the Dalai Lama is a frequent visitor. I feel just bliss, and I feel this is me, there is no separation, and I feel more energy, more relaxation, more joy of life, and more peace. This academic and spiritualist insists there is a special energy here. It's a really a strong energy point, a really big, uh, strong power spot. And this is because uh, ley lines, energy lines, are leading through, passing through this mountain. Everybody has heard about the Dalai Lama, and I have friends who met him there and heard him saying that the Untersberg is the heart chakra of the world. You know, I'm not sure about all this energy centre stuff and mysterious disappearances, but let's face it, the view here is incredible enough to be inspiring. And underneath the mountain range, a subterranean salt mine. Salt all along the sides here. And you can feel the atmosphere changing. A bit colder, a bit fresher already. The salt deposits here were what made Berchtesgaden wealthy in the 12th century. And slides like these were used by miners to move between levels. I'm sure they didn't see it as a playground, mind you. a thrill. Wow, I can do that over and over again. <laughs> Fantastic. But there's more to this salt mine than just being a great source of wealth for Bechtel's Garden, because this place apparently has got magical powers, healing energy, and I'm going to find out some more about that. Thank you. 
So every year we have about 15,000 guests who are coming mainly for health reasons. Because we have two things, we have wonderful air and salty air. Jan von Werten manages a salt cure gallery deep in the mine. Twice a month we have a combination of relaxation and music. Apparently the salt neutralizes background radiation to encourage deep relaxation and it's said an overnight stay can cure everything from tinnitus to insomnia and asthma. And people are just sleeping and resting. Yes. And the tuning and the sound is really good as well. We have a wonderful acoustic here inside, so it's just like a church. Yeah. They call this event a sonic journey. I have the big feeling that humans are so easily touched by, by sound and music, and especially by the, by the human voice. If we are here inside the mountain, we feel or hear, even with our heart, the rhythm of earth. This is a, a powerful place. So just lean back and do nothing. And, and you will feel the power of earth, the power of, of the creation. And the power of creation includes the human voice. So there are two notes at the same time. That's and I can just move them separately. It's about 11 o'clock now at night. We've been here for three hours. Tell me how you're feeling at the moment. I feel very calm and relaxed. I feel the talking in my mind gets more quiet and quiet, and I feel like I'm breathing out like, ah. Oh. It's very meditative, it's very calming. You can feel very free and wide. You can travel in your fantasy, and you can fall really nicely. Hmm. As the night wears on, I can't seem to drift off quite as easily as my fellow guests. It's um, a quarter to one in the morning and they're still going strong. And frankly, I can't see myself getting any sleep anytime soon. It's quite cold, but I have got a secret weapon. A hot water bottle. So that should keep me warm at least for a bit, because it is pretty, pretty chilly. And on, and on it went. <laughs> With a short respite that lulled me into a full sense of relaxation. <laughs> then, this wake-up call. At 7am, it was time to pack up and go, after not the best night's sleep I've ever had. We're on our way out, emerging, bleary-eyed. I had a couple of hours sleep in between the booming drums and the didgeridoo. It's been an experience, let's put it that way. Wow, right. From the border with Austria, we head north and deep into the Bavarian forest, close to the Czech border. 
this is a land rich in mythology, and there's one creature that features very strongly in that folklore. The wolf, here in the National Park, a relatively new and rare tourist attraction. You can see there's a typical uh, wolf markings. So they have normally at the, at the cheeks and at the, at the muscles, they are white. They have white dots above the eyes. And so it's a very colorful face they have. Also the ears are very small in comparison to a lot of dogs. It's a really attractive, beautiful animal. Nothing like the kind of image of a nasty, villainous creature that it's portrayed as. For most of the 20th century, wolves in Germany were hunted to the point of extinction. But then, in the 1990s, they started to come back, crossing over from neighbouring countries. Now we have 40 packs across Germany, and uh, on average they, they have about five pups per pack, and so you can imagine 200 pups each year. So it's a really uh, increase in population size. The reappearance of the wolf in Germany has divided opinion. As a wolf is an animal as every other animal, but in our heads, wolves are different. So wolves belong to the ecosystem, and so wolves are important for the national park. And there are some people who like wolves and others who hate wolves, so that's a huge controversy. And I think there's no other animal in, in Europe which is so controversial as wolves. I'm in the pitch black countryside now, uh, and I'm about to meet a whole group of people who've got a very different take on the wolf, um, and they're taking part tonight in a annual celebration that is, I've been told, unique. The festival takes place in the town of Rinchnach and celebrates the ancient custom of herdsmen ringing bells to scare wolves away. Hans. Hello. Hello. Hans is one of the organizers. These are the famous bells that I've heard about. Es ist eigentlich überall ausgestorben, nur bei hier in Rinchnach hat sie diese Tradition gehalten und ist eigentlich auch gewachsen. Das muss man eigentlich so sagen. Tonight, hundreds of local people will form teams of bell ringers. And I'm joining in too, a rare privilege for a non-Bavarian. First, I need the right outfit. And what is the point of these twigs? Es ist gedacht für die Fliegen im Sommer. Ah. Weil durch diese Bewegung bleiben die Fliegen einfach weg. I'm going to look like a Christmas tree. Oh, no. <laughs> good. Very good. Very good. Yeah. The headgear pales into insignificance once I realize I'll be lugging this 20 kilogram bell around. You're the Glock. Okay. I'm the Glock. <laughs> so heavy, it's ridiculous. The technique is very simple. You must only try to get the Glock out of the Oberschenkel. Heraus, also nicht die Glocke auf die Knie zu schmeißen, mm. weil das ist nicht so gut, sondern die eher auf der Innenseite Oberschenkel, weil sie dann abrollt. Die Glocke rollt dann ab und dann, wenn sie zum Schluss versuchen, weit nach oben zu heben. Das ist das ganze Spiel. Okay, so I'm taking this bell over to the house here and I think there's some people here who have been doing it as well. Did you hear me coming by any chance? Oh. So, you two are also taking part this yes, year? Yes, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. How big a night is this for you? I think it's uh, the biggest night of the year, uh, something like this. Yeah, nowhere else is something like this. And so, yeah, we're very proud of it and we also want to take part of it. Have you ever thought about wearing earplugs? Yes, I have. Oh, you have them? Yes. All right. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, you, you it's, have to. it's impossible without them. OK, right. I'll bear that in mind. That's very good advice. <laughs> Thank you very much. I join the rest of the team as we head towards the town centre. Nothing could have prepared me for the incredible din that's generated heaving these enormous bells around. 
I'm trying not to use my knees, but it's almost impossible. They feel battered and bruised already. We're greeted by a huge crowd of tourists and locals. Hans' son, Dominic, is the flamboyant leader, rousing the troops, leading the beat, and conducting the cacophony. Luckily for me, after half an hour, Dominic calls time for a much needed break. Wow, that was one of the most physically intensive thing as I've ever done. Amazing. <laughs> Tribal, but great. And I deserve this. What does it feel like to be leading this bunch of group of people with a loud noise? I've learned to do one thing here is to try and look beyond the straight-laced conservative image of the people of Bavaria. I've been truly moved by their warmth, passion and sheer quirkiness. It's been a unique adventure.